Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the workshop. Our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome to yet another sneak peek into our biology and bioengineering summer camp. In this summer camp, we'll learn about the world of biology and bioengineering in the 21st century. Let us meet our guest speaker, Dr. Amit Tha. Dr. Amit Tha joins us from Atrid Tata Memorial. Dr. Dutt works as principal investigator at Acre. He received his first doctoral PhD in plant genetics from ICGEV, New Delhi. Later on, he received another PhD degree in developmental biology from the Institute of Life Sciences, University of Zurich. He completed his postdoctoral studies with Dr. Matthew Mearson at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT and the Dana Freiburg Cancer Institute, Boston. In 2017, he was awarded the Shanti Swarup Patnagar Award in the field of medical sciences and technology. He's also the recipient of Swiss National Science Foundation Fellowship Award, the Julius Klaus Foundation Award from the University of Zurich, the Ramalindam Swami Fellowship Award from the Department of Biotechnology, the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance Intermediate Fellowship Award, the YIM Boston Young Scientist Award, and Outstanding Alumni Award from JMI. Dr. Da is a faculty member in Medical Genetics at Thousand Prime. He serves on the editorial board of PLOS One and PMC Genomics. He also serves on the scientific advisory committees and screening and selection committees of various government and private organizations. We are really excited to have Dr. Amit Dutt with us. See you at the summer camp. All right, so we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Amit Dutt, who is one of the pioneers of uh, cancer genomics in India. And uh, you know, it's really great privilege for us that he's going to share his experience with all of you. Over to you, Amit. So, so a, a good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Sanjeeva. Uh, thank you very much uh, for doing this initiative program. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, this is going to uh, have a lot of like uh, great waves among the students and uh, introduce them to the field. And, and of course, they will be more um, uh, informed to take an informed decision to get into the research. So, and thank you for having me. Um, um, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, uh, my presentation is more um, uh, oriented for the high school students um, and um, it, it, and besides that it is also a distinct pleasure that my own tiny dot now she is a teenager and she will be attending in uh, this this presentation so uh, so the students uh, this would be primarily um, for uh, more of like school level uh, where I would be emphasizing that how important time this is today in the cancer research, in the history of cancer research, um, that's such a dynamic state that what we have kind of like reached on to uh, with all the advancement that what it is kind of like have already been contributed in the field. Um, uh, this is really a point of like an inflection uh, in the uh, decade to come with all the uh, technologies uh, that has come to um, uh, 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 come to our uh, rescue for the uh, application uh, in understanding of the different complexities of the cancer. Uh, that this is this is something that is going to revolutionize the treatment that what we are going to see in this decade to come. So I'm going to give you a, a basics on how exactly um, uh, are these complexities that underlies in the cancer genome and uh, emphasize more again what uh, Dr. Vaish and uh, Dr. Uh, Shivastava has already been talking about since the morning um, and, and to, to, to add more into the genomics aspect of it. 
So let's 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 get started with some uh, clinical perspective to it. Um, so um, here is uh, uh, here is a scenario of uh, uh, a nine-year-old girl presenting herself to a pediatrician with some fever and bruising. So some blood counts are done, and it found that these blood counts are abnormal. So a bone marrow test is performed, and that reveals that uh, uh, that the girl is unfortunately uh, suffering with acute leukemia, some kind of a blood cancer disorder. Um, a, a multi drug uh, we have been talking about since, like in the morning, uh, a regimen of chemotherapy is offered to her through infusions, and uh, uh, the patient enters into remission in three weeks. And in about two years, uh, uh, the cancer gets cured. It has been 12 years since, um, and the patient is still alive. In the same settings, with, with the same doctors, with the same nurses, with the same treatment, here there is an, another patient which represents um, the similar clinical presentation. Here is a seven-year-old boy with fever and bruising. Um, bone marrow reveals that this is an acute leukemia again same treatment is being offered to this patient as well. Unfortunately, this kid succumbs to the treatment uh, in just six months. So this is something which is uh, paradigmatic for uh, different kind of like questions like to be really be asked that um, what exactly is missing in this underlying uh, clinical uh, manifestations or clinical presentations of these patients where we are kind of failing that two individual with the same clinical presentation, uh, one responds to the treatment, another does not respond to the treatment. So um, to understand this clinical variability, now we have much, um, uh, that's something that I'm going to be like showing you through my slides that what underlies this uh, uh, clinical presentation is the molecular complexity and how uh, the paradigm that has always been uh, uh, in the field since uh, last 60 years or something about uh, to treat cancer as a single disease, this has significantly been changing. Cancer is not a, sig um, not a single disease or a bunch of few diseases, but um, uh, uh, but uh, a complex group of several different diseases that could be more specified by the underlying molecular alterations that define it, that we have been emphasizing it since morning today. Um, so um, we will get back to this patient and uh, we will get back to see that what exactly are the two underlying differences that defines these two patients and perhaps might be responsible for the dis different or distinct um, response to the same treatment that is being given to them. But let's get started with like the basics of the cancer and um, uh, with, with a normal cell. So here is a normal tissue um, where, where most of the tissues in the human body, they're there are a defined number of it. For example, your kidney cells have a defined number of cells, um, no less, no more. But there are occasionally, there are incidences when they require to uh, create more cells. And um, that could be an injury or, or, uh, or, or uh, for several different aspects of it, even in the natural settings. How does that happen? So there is a set of survival signal that instructs the cells perhaps a stem cell that you have been listening earlier as well, and that um, stimulates these cells to define, to multiply, and multiply in a very fixed number. Um, uh, and then what happens on the other side of the equation is that uh, these cells, they have uh, the, the instructions which is coded inside them that, oh, when, how long they have to survive, and when they need to die. So this is something what kind of like defines and, and define the settings, this balance, which is which you may have read in your textbook about the homeostasis. And that's how it's kind of like maintained by the balancing between the proliferation signal and the death signal um, to define the number of the pool of like cells, which remains in a very defined order. 
In the settings of cancer that would generally kind of like get to see, there are different underlying alterations uh, that happens. So here, what is happening is that somehow these cells, they become independent of the survival signal. Now, there is an alteration in the genome of this cancer cells, which is a kind of a gain of function alteration. What it means is that certain genes, when they get mutated, uh, they acquire a function in which they are always active. It's like an accelerator of a car. So the accelerator has gone wrong and it's very difficult to stop the car now. So the cells are proliferating. So people thought that, aha, this is how it is. So it's the proliferation and it's these mutations in these genes, what they call as an oncogene, which when activated leads to a higher proliferation of the cells are the causal or are the real culprits that leads to the cancer. But it turns out that the proliferation in cancer cell is very much comparable to the normal cell. The proliferation is in no way faster. It's just that it's deregulated. In fact, the proliferation in several of different tumor types is, is, uh, is slower than the normal cells. Now, how is this balance is kind of like being um, maintained? So on the other side of the equation, there is an another kind of like alteration that can really happen. And there are a set of genes which are called as tumor suppressor genes. These are, um, uh, 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 these are uh, kind of like brakes in your car, okay? So if the brake fails, again, the ideal purpose of the brake is to counter the accelerator, right? And there is a balance between this accelerator and the count and, and the brake that would really um, uh, uh, that would um, uh, really define how fast or where uh, how, how the car has to move. But when there is a uh, brake fail or when there is a mutation in these tumor cells, these cells they receive the death signal, but they they decline to die. They deny to die. They say, no, thank you. We are good by itself. Despite uh, the underlying insults to our genome, which has uh, given uh, from where these signals have arose uh, about, uh, about um, uh, the cells to die, despite that signal, the cells um, uh, keep hanging out over there and keep surviving. In case of cancer, things kind of like get like really, really bad when both of these alterations, they happen together. And this is something that you get to see in majority of the tumor type, where uh, there is an activation in an oncogene. And along with that, there is also uh, an inactivation of the class of genes that we call it as a tumor suppressor gene, which, which brings us to the paradigm, a change in the paradigm in the way that people have been, had been doing uh, uh, way past, like maybe about like uh, since, um, uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, Dr. Shivata has already been talking about like even the times of the Mendel and all, well, uh, they did not have the genetic basis around for that, but then, um, so they had a completely different understanding of the underlying reason for the cancer. But, but these paradigms, these understanding are changing the cancer as a genetic disease. And uh, what exactly does a genetic disease mean? Uh, does it mean that you inherit from your parents? No. Well, in some cancers, about 5% of cancer that does happen as well, that the genes that you inherit encode for the cancer. But cancer is a disease that develops post-birth. So it's, it's, it's a very strange kind of a disease in which the same individual is harboring two different kind of uh, cells with two different kind of genomes. So when we say that cancer is a genetic disease, that what it means is that, um, uh, that uh, the ramification the, the of, it's, it's, it's the reflection of the genome alterations and that uh, expresses itself in the form of um, transformation of the cell or in the form of uh, cancer. So uh, does that mean, uh, does that mean that, um, a cigarette smoking or other different dietary which has been associated with cancer does not have an effect on cancer if it is a genetic disease and if everything is to the genome? No. What these alterations, what these insults do, such as cigarette smoking, which is very strongly associated with lung cancer, they modify the genome. 
So it's the modification of the genome, it's the modification of the genetic material of these cells that represents itself in the form of um, uh, a transformation of the cell. And that's what we kind of like get to see. So if you would compare the, the genome of a normal cell and the genome of a tumor cell in the same individual. So that's why I kind of like called it that it's a strange disease that the same individual is having two different genome sets. So in the tumor cells, um, in a normal cell, there would be about 20,000 odd genes, depending on how you call as a definition of a gene, it could be higher or it could even be lower. So uh, in the cancer cell, it would be uh, due to these alterations, in principle, they, they would be 99% or something around identical. However, it's the one person that would be having a multiple copies of certain genes or certain genes would be deleted. So it's, it's, it's a different genome that is uh, underlying in the cancer genome and in, in, in the cancer cells. So now, now that we understand that there is a genetic basis that um, reflects itself in the form of the phenotype that what we call as cancer, Let's go back to the patient one. That's what um, uh, that's what I kind of like mentioned that we would be coming back to. So the patient one, if we would recall, um, uh, responded very well to the treatment. The treatment was not um, uh, very elegant. It was a chemotherapy. It was an infusion of chemotherapy. However, the response was um, uh, that the patient got cured. So uh, with more of an understanding of the genetic under, um, uh, alterations or the genetic basis of cancer, when people looked at the, uh, the, the chromosomes of these patients, of the first patient, it turns out that there is an event which is called as a translocation that underlies this cancer. And this translocation is the fusion of chromosome 12 to the chromosome 21 while the genes which are there on these two chromosomes, um, away from the fusion side, they least care about where they are and they, 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 uh, uh, they keep performing uh, their, uh, their function as it is. However, at the point of juncture, what it leads to is a kind of a fusion protein, which in this case is a fusion, a chimeric protein, which in this case is a TEL and AML1 protein. Now, this protein did not exist in the cancer genome in the normal cell. This is a newer protein that kind of requires this. So then the quest kind of like started, wow, uh, this is, uh, but then there was always, um, there was always a resistance to the cancer genetic basis of cancer. So, so the question that kind of like arose is that, is this the causal to the cancer or is it a consequence to the cancer that people kind of argued that, you know, Everything kind of like goes awry, and once the cancer gets, I mean, the cell gets transformed, you get to see uh, these kind of like alterations. But it turns out to be the other way. So, so people went out to see if this is a uh, if this is a single event that that what is in. So they what did they do? They went ahead and looked for these kind of like alterations in several different patients, and it turns out that about uh, thirty percent of these leukemia patients. Um, they have this translocation event that we just kind of like talked about, the TEL-AML1 mutation uh, translocation. And most of these patients who are harboring these translocation events, here it is chromosome 12 to chromosome 21. And most of these patients, they perform well to the chemotherapy. So now you are having a genetic basis, which is kind of allowing you to uh, define the prognosis that what is going to be the outcome of a treatment based on the underlying genetic alteration. Now, what happens to the second patient who did not respond? Turns out that that patient is harboring uh, another kind of a, um, translocation event, which is called as a translocation from um, uh, chromosome nine to 22. You may have read in your textbook uh, because now it has gone to the school books uh, where the two genes involved in this case is a BCR and ABEL. ABEL is a kinase. It turns out that at that time when the chemotherapy was being offered, 10% would only respond to the treatment. Majority of them, then about 90% of them would succumb to the treatment. Okay, so 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 with, with this understanding of the genetic uh, um, 
uh, genetic disease. Now that people kind of like knew that these genetic alterations, uh, defining these genetic alterations, are allowing people to understand the prognosis or how how the uh, how uh, the patient is going to respond to the treatment. The questions were asked that these are distinct alterations, right? This one is a distinct alteration. So can there be um, a therapeutic implication to this as well? Be differential. And because these proteins are exclusively in the tumor cells and they are absent in the normal cell, so can you design a treatment against the CML able? Now that, la now that defines the beginning of uh, the precision medicine. So, um, uh, a lot of work was kind of like, but but I would what I want to really emphasize onto this aspect is like, look at the amount of the time that really kind of like really took to identify these molecular players. First of all, these chromosomes, the translocation events were identified, which is called as the Philadelphia chromosome. You may have read in your textbooks, um, identifying the molecular genes which are involved into it, looking for uh, inhibitors. So finally, um, uh, you may have read about the inhibitor Gleevec. So this Gleevec was finally discovered and clinical trial was performed and it was approved in 2001. Now, since then, these patients, which are only 10% of those survived before 2001, since the uh, introduction of Gleevec, um, there has have been 100% response or close to 100% response among these patients. So such is the power of precision medicine where you are uh, discerning between the or uh, discerning between a normal cell genome and the tumor cell genome and targeting specifically the tumor cell genome alteration which is not present in the normal cell. So uh, but then there has been a lot of like resistance against, I mean, this precision medicine, it is a newer paradigm. It's changing the way uh, uh, people have been kind of like treating. But then how the people have been treating across the globe, if there is one line or even half a sentence that I would use to define how really the cancer treatment is being offered, even today across the globe, is something this. To give as much as poison as possible without killing the patient. And that's the chemotherapy. So, and when you are working with experimental compound and experimental drugs, um, you go even much higher. You go to an extent uh, that uh, you realize that, oh, oh this dose uh, patient is not going to take any further. De-escalate, go towards dose uh, bitch prior, and that would be the dose how they would be defining for that experimental drug. So essentially, and it's 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 really uh, astounding that how it really kind of like really it's, it's it's amazing how it really works, and and also pretty cured, crude. In times to come, when perhaps uh, perhaps in your own lifetime, when you would be uh, out there, uh, the clinicians and the scientists, uh, uh, and um, uh, or um, uh, in the society kind of like uh, getting to see that perhaps you would look back into the history and you would say that um, uh, uh, that how crude was the treatment that was being offered and what was exactly the basis of it that you would push a patient uh, to an extent by giving it a poison and um, 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 just to an extent that uh, the patient doesn't die and then you rescue that patient hoping that it, the cancer cells would not kind of like really kind of like uh, come back. So that, so, so we, are, we, are, we are challenging this paradigm with the precision medicine. And it's still a learning process. It's still kind of like happening around. So now, um, uh, how do you do that? How do, you, how do you really look for more of these kind of like alterations uh, in the cancer genome is something that I'm going to emphasize over the next few slides. So are there more BCR ables out there? Can there be more Gleevex out there? And how would you really figure it out? So um, it has been um, uh, alluded to, I mean, in, in fact, one of the questions that was being asked by one of the students where, uh, you already kind of like mentioned that there are 3 billion bases on the human genome. And these 3 billion bases, there are, um, uh, there are about like 20,000 genes. 
uh, uh, this number kind of like changes, uh, which gene might be harboring these alterations in cancer? Because now we are sitting out in a path where we are wanting to um, discover more of these BCR able kind of genes that can give a 100% response and without having, now what are these kind of like uh, treatment for this Gleevec? Gleevec is given orally, you know, it's not an infusion. So it's given orally, much like a diabetes, like any chronic disease, one, one pill a day. So now the, uh, the quest is that if you could find more of these alterations and what kind of like these alterations, something like that the normal cell would have a T G G C kind of a base in the genome, while the tumor cell would have a T G G C and one kind of like mutation, right? So, um, so um, thanks to the um, uh, Dr. Shivastava has already kind of like talked about the human genome sequencing project. So now that we already have, it was first introduced in 2001 and then more in 2004 uh, um, uh, to, to, to quite a certain extent of like its completion. Um, we already have this reference sequence available with us. We already know the human reference genome. So now all you have to do is to sequence the tumor genome, align it, compare it to it and look for these alterations. But then, uh, as what I said earlier, that this um, this decade, uh, you would be seeing, um, uh, it's really an exciting time because of the technology um, that is allowing us to questions which otherwise wasn't like possible to do. So how would you really look for 3 billion bases? It's, it's, it's a humongous task, right? So uh, people go on uh, to uh, approach it in a hypothesis driven manner. In, in, in a systematic hypothesis driven manner where they started with that, okay, I do not have the capacity to look at the whole human genome, but let me go in a very targeted manner, such as I would look for all the kinases. Kinase is a class of a gene. There are about 510 odd kinases. So now that's still a, 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 a reasonable number as opposed to 20,000 gene and as opposed to 3 billion bases of the human genome, right? So approaches were designed where people would start at sequencing uh, the kinases. So one of the first projects uh, during my postdoctoral lab where I had kind of like joined at the Dana Farber. So they were sequencing uh, all the kinases in lung cancer. And here is a city scan. Uh, here is, is a, um, uh, which which is kind of like really showing you uh, this radiographic picture uh, is that here, uh, there was a, it's, it's of a clinical trial, okay? So this clinical trial, this patient, this is, um, you can look at the thick opacity in the lung cancer. Uh, and here you're seeing that this patient received a drug called as IRESA. They did not know what exactly is the target of it. And, but they did know that there were like a, um, a good percentage of patients that responded to the IRESA treatment. So they went on to go ahead and sequence those patients who responded to IRESA and those who did not respond to IRESA by sequencing these 500 um, uh, kinases. So um, uh, in fact, in the initial approach, they had only selected, you know, I mean, the technology was always uh, a limiting factor. They were sequencing only about um, uh, 50 of these kinases. And it turns out, bingo, it turns out that one of the kinase that the EGFR was harboring mutation among these guys, those patients who were responding to the treatment. Remember, similar to the CML uh, in leukemia, those, those people had the uh, BCR able alteration. So here is a point mutation in EGFR. And it turns out uh, that 10% of Caucasian and about 30% in the, more than 30% in the East Asian population have it. So our lab uh, went ahead and defined uh, these mutations in the Indian population, and there is some intermediate frequency of 23%. What is the, what is the impact of this uh, discovery? The impact is as follows. In 2004, if a lung cancer stage four disease patient walks up into the clinic, he would have, he or she would have an option uh, or the, the only survival that would be left would not be more than seven to eight months. Today, the same patient can imagine harboring these alterations and lifespan of 60 months. So you're comparing seven to eight months to 60 months, 
And if, if the patient further responds to the different generation drugs of which is targeting um, uh, this gene, and if the further, further response to immunotherapy, some of the students were keen to uh, ask questions on about it, um, this can get further expanded too. So such is the such is the power of the precision medicine where the treatments are being tailored not based on um, um, uh, um, uh, just a generic histological uh, origin of the tumor that they are all lung cancer, they are all leukemia, but based on the underlying genetic alteration, uh, such as the impact, seven to eight months to so 60 months and beyond. And this is happening in the clinics right across, even at the Tata Memorial Center, these uh, treatments are approved and being given. So here's what it is. So this is a CT scan of a patient and you can see the lung from the top. And what you're seeing over here is that these are the nodules in the lung and these are EGFR mutation positive. You give orally a tablet to this patient, which is EGFR inhibitor and such drastic is the response in two months. Okay, so now it uh, uh, turns out that um, let's go out and that's what I've been kind of like involved, being very much fortunate, being associated at very good centers uh, and then coming back and like joining at Tata Memorial Center uh, to have the right settings to do these kind of like discoveries. So uh, initially, uh, one of the early discoveries that what I, uh, my postdoctoral work uh, led to is the discovery of uh, mutation in an another tyrosine kinase, in an under kinase, which is called as FGFR2. So EGFR is a tyrosine kinase, it's a kinase gene where there is an inhibitor, there is an FGFR2, and that was found to be mutated in a different cancer, that is an endometrial cancer. Till date, there is no treatment to endometrial cancer, or at least the relapse or an advanced state of an endometrial cancer. Now, this is a great response. This is a great hope that these patients, about like 10 to 12 person, patient, percent of endometrial cancer harbor mutation in FGFR2. So we went ahead and there was something very interesting aspect associated with it. We found, uh, we found that these mutations, sometimes they also occur in a family, in the germline. And it was found that when it happens in a family, it leads to some kind of craniofacial disorder. Um, your, uh, it's a bone malfunction kind of thing, a malformation, and that is called as an Eppert syndrome. And what we found that was very interesting is that exactly the same mutation, the identical mutation. So here is a spectrum of mutation that we found in the endometrial cancer patients. And you would see this mutation. This is exactly the same mutation that was found in these uh, patients who do not live for that long though, unfortunately. These are, if it is happening before your birth, it is primarily congenital disease. When it is happening in the somatic settings, it leads to cancer. We went on to show that um, when you use inhibitors similar to the EGFR inhibitor, these cells which are harboring these mutations, uh, they respond to the treatment. So now what does that mean? That opens a completely newer opportunity to treat endometrial cancer with FGFR inhibitors. So moving on, um, moving on, uh, we went on to kind of like emphasize more onto this and make more of these kind of like discoveries. So when we were working on the Indian settings, um, we wanted to ask that if there is something which is unique to the Indian settings or something uh, when we are looking at the um, uh, lung cancer genome among Indian cancer patients at a resolution that was not seen before. So one of the first graduate students in the lab uh, took two set, of, uh, two set of samples. One, he calls it as a discovery set and the other he calls it as a validation set, okay? So in the discovery set, he sequences. So you remember people were, people were kind of going, um, we, we were doing uh, the first EGFR discovery was done by sequencing 50 kinases. The FGFR2 discovery that I made was done by sequencing 500 kinases. 
and you finding FGFR1 to be mutated. In this case, Pratik Chandrani, a graduate student in the lab, he goes ahead and he looks for all the different known mutations in across different cancers, which is already known, and he sequences using a platform that Dr. Shivastava has already kind of like introduced to you, not taking you into the detail because that's not exactly the focus of the talk, but I will be happy to talk about some other day. That platform is called Next Generation Sequencing Platform. This is an advanced sequencing platform uh, as compared to the Sanger sequencing, the dideoxy method that you have already kind of like seen a few minutes back. So um, uh, sequence these 125 samples, find for mutation, and then validate them. You have to always validate these kind of like findings in an, another set of 400 samples. And what did we find is shown here. What Pratik Chandrani kind of presents over here is that here is the spectrum of mutations, completely uh, giving a newer taxonomy to lung cancer, okay? These are all histologically called as lung adenocarcinomas, but you could see that they cannot receive the same treatment and they are not receiving same treatment as of now while I'm talking to you. These patients are receiving um, defined treatments if they are harboring eml al 4 if they are harboring EGFR, if they are harboring KRAS. In fact, the earlier talk by Dr. Amit Boyesh, uh, he's from Amgen, and uh, that's one of the companies which is the, one of the leading uh, producer of a KRAS material that recently got an FDA approved. So not based on whether the uh, patient who is walking into the clinic has a, a lung cancer, but based on what is the molecular underpinnings that according to which the treatment is now being trailered, and that's what the precision medicine is all about. When we, when we are making these discoveries, what we found uh, a significant number of a novel mutation in an, another kinase in lung adenocarcinoma patients, lung cancer patients of Indian origin, and um, that's in an, another gene, FGFR3. Now, uh, this gene was not found to be mutated in the Caucasian or the different population. Um, uh, in fact, after we have reported since then, this mutation has been shown, this gene to be mutated in this cancer has been shown even in the South Korean population. So it looks like that possibly this mutation might be more Asian specific. I'm not talking about the ethnicity or the, uh, we just talked about the differences in the EGFR mutation across different ethnicity, right? So I'm not talking about emphasizing on the ethnicity and the basis of it. That would be, could be a subject for some other talk, but uh, a major discovery was made in the lab of FGFR. Why is it a major discovery? It's only 5%. Well, in India, the lung cancer is one of the most common cancer among men. The denominator itself is huge. 5% of that denominator is more than the load, the total burden of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So it's a complete whole disease in its own self. And why do I say it's a completely reclassifying or re-taxonomy of cancer is that you see that all of these cancer is a disease in its own. Don't call them lung cancer. And I mean, of course they are lung cancer, but then they are lung cancer driven by these alterations. And, and that is important for designing uh, therapeutic um, interventions to these patients. So here is an, uh, a classical example. Here is an oral cancer patient um, who is harboring uh, FGFR2 mutations. You remember, we found like uh, FGFR3 uh, alterations uh, in lung cancer. So, and this patient, uh, uh, an oral cancer, and this uh, hedonic cancer, and uh, this patient receives pezopanib, which is an inhibitor against the FGFRs. Okay, and uh, this patient, and again, orally, in two weeks, such is the drastic response. So, which, which kind of like really uh, bolstered us that the discovery of the newer FGFR that what we had made in the laboratory uh, could actually be translated and patients. So now when I sit on the tumor board, I see um, uh, patients uh, with those mutations. So, but then when you, when you find these mutations uh, in, 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 in a genomic setting where you sequence the genome and you identify, you have to always validate those. So cutting a long story short, a lot of biochemical assays were done, a lot of cellular assays were done, but then the emphasis comes about that when you validate these mutations by um, the gold standard is that these mutations, which are derived from the cancer patients, if they can really form tumors in mice. And indeed, what we found is that 
uh, these mutations derived from the lung cancer patients, they could find a tumor in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an experiment where we um, uh, establish a xenograft assays where you, you inject the cells in the skin, under the skin. And then you give inhibitors to these guys orally and see if there is a reduction in the size of the tumor. And uh, uh, we perform bioluminescence and other different kind of like uh, assays to monitor the growth of the tumor. And, and it turns out to be a great success that these patients would be, uh, uh, that these patients are likely to be responding to the FGFR inhibitors. But then the real question kind of like comes in that uh, we get like more sophisticated. As what I said earlier, so the time has come where all the technologies and the tools are coming to our, um, uh, um, um, coming to uh, our age to ask questions which otherwise wasn't possible to do before. So what we do now is that we take it, uh, we had just injected into the, uh, earlier was just injected into the skin, right? And to see, but that's not exactly lung. So now what we do, we go ahead and we establish orthotopic mouse model. What is an orthotopic mouse model? We use the same organ. The cells are injected in the same organ. The lung cancer cells are injected into the mouse of the lung cancer cell. So this is what is being done by a postdoc in the lab, Dr. Ashwin Butley. And there is an incision made over here, do you see? And there is a microsurgery being done and the, and the cells are being uh, injected into the one lobe of the, of the uh, of the uh, of the lung of the mice and what you tend to see so initially this is being done with a dye to see how good it is and then you take out the uh, uh, take out the lungs uh, uh, I'm sure one of the students was asking earlier today that why animals so I will tell you why animals um, let's keep the ethical part apart but I'll tell you why animals so here um, otherwise it wouldn't be possible to ask these kind of like questions. So in these, when you're putting up the dye, you are able to see that how exactly you're, uh, whether you're able to uh, reach onto the lungs or not. And then when you take the cells with the, uh, uh, when you take the cells with, um, uh, with the luciferase stat in those cells, and when you inject into the lung, you do a luminescence as, I mean, you do uh, these kind of imaging. And then even without sacrificing the animal, you would be able to see how the tumors are progressing. And that's what we were successful in kind of like doing. Now you can um, give inhibitors to these orally and you can kind of monitor that how the tumors are regressing. Now, you, it wouldn't be possible for you to test these uh, as what Dr. Amit Vaish was also kind of like emphasizing that preclinical models before getting into the clinical setting. So these models, teach us that how they are likely to respond to these treatments in an in vivo at an organism level, right? So that's what we kind of like doing it. So that was um, uh, in the Indian um, uh, or, um, uh, lung cancer. And, and this is what uh, we kind of like dissected further. And uh, through this uh, complicated slide, basically I just want to kind of like show that the tumors that are formed in the lungs of the mice is something which is very comparable to the tumors that what we kind of like see in the human. There is a fluid which is called a pleural effusion that usually, um, uh, that usually you take it out from the lung cancer patients. And we could kind of like see that when we take out the pleural effusion from the mice, we could see that even those guys were having the fluorescence because the cells were tagged with the luciferase, which tells that the tumor cells are also getting into the, uh, in, 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 into the solutions um, and uh, into these effusions. Uh, and uh, so very much mimicking the lung and that allows us to ask questions with otherwise what not possible to ask not just into the lung cancer. So, um, so uh, 50 genes, 50 kinases started and found EGFR, 500 kinases found FGFR, did an NGS and then uh, in a limited set of genes and we found a, uh, FGFR3. We, we, now we get more, um, uh, now we get like kind of like more into that, okay, uh, let's be more naive. Uh, uh, we wanted to now at this point of time study ten, tongue cancer, okay? Uh, tongue cancer, or oral cancer happens to be one of the most common cancer. Uh, 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 um, uh, among, among, among the Indian patients. So uh, it's, it's one of the most predominant one. They are associated with tobacco, right? Um, they are associated with tobacco, right? So, um, uh, but then uh, these diseases, uh, if you have to understand, um, we, we, uh, we took an unbiased approach. We took an approach that um, 
we are very unsmart people. We really do not know where to look at. We have no upfront, no a priori hypothesis. Earlier, you could see that people were doing that with the kinases. So there was an hypothesis that we had earlier that let's look into the kinases and we got lucky. Here, now that, but that was also because of the reason, because the technology was limiting. Now the next generation sequencing technology allows us to look at all the 20,000 genes in one go. So if because of this availability of the technology, that's what we kind of like did in the tongue cancer um, uh, patients. What is shown over here is a typical heat map representation. What you have, and now what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to surprise you. What I'm going to show you is that these are the different patients, tongue cancer patients, and here are the genes in the rows. Columns are the patients, uh, the re, uh, rows are the genes, and those solid blocks are mutations in those genes in those patients. So what do you get to see? Oh, it's so much of a variability across the genes. If you're looking at different, different individuals, these are all tongue cancers, right? This guy is harboring mutation in this gene, these guys, this guy is harboring mutation in these genes. What exactly is happening over here? So uh, it, it is far more complex than what we had kind of like initially thought. The number of mutations that what it kind of like uh, uh, really acquires is, is way too more uh, when we are looking at in a very unbiased manner. So that's where the statistics kind of like come in. Where exactly to focus now, the problem is. So the statistics comes in and a graduate student uh, starts to work on a gene called as Notch1 that was found to be significantly uh, deregulated in oral cancer based on the genomic discoveries and finds also that Notch1 was amplified. This is a copy number space. This is a mutation space. And uh, it, it shows that it is mutated the genes are mutated and the genes has higher copy number and multiple copies of the gene is also present. So um, uh, earlier, um, uh, uh, earlier um, a statement was made by Dr. Vyash, Dr. Amit Vyash, is that um, uh, um, the underpinnings of, um, uh, of cancer is now kind of like uh, getting much um, understood and it's, it's much uh, kind of like uh, defined. That is true for at the histological part. So this is an histological, looking the cells under a microscope. If you would look a normal cell, a normal oral epithelium cell, epithelium, what you're getting to see is an intact lamina over here. Do you see this border? Then you're seeing into the tumor, this is all dissolved. I mean, the cells have kind of like invaded. There is, there is no structure to it. That's what we kind of like. So now we had found a notch gene to be mutated as what I shown with the genomics. So, but then when you're doing into the clinics, you would not be able to do that sequencing, right? So you would want to have an, another way of looking at the notch in the clinics. How would you do that? There is a technology which is uh, pathologists that kind of like use that is called an immunohistochemistry. What they do is that they take a tag and they uh, look for that specific protein. So when they look for that specific protein, this in case happens to be the notch that we had already found because now we have uh, nailed it down to notch and found to be mutated, they find that this is how it looks like in the normal cells. The expression is there in the normal cells, and I will get back to this again towards my last. The expression of notch one is there in the normal cells, but then in the tumor, it is boom. It is like way too high. Now we find that about like 40% of these tongue cancer patients are harboring notch uh, alteration. And there is a treatment to it. There is a treatment in other different cancer. So um, and there was a lot of work that was done to show that these cells, which are having notch mutation, they respond to that treatment. Again, that's an opportunity for newer treatment um, in, 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 in oral cancer, which was not known before. But then when you are bringing in other different kind of like treatment, um, um, uh, uh, the other, uh, uh, you have to always validate it, right? So now, uh, uh, the other discoveries from these unbiased approach that what we had taken was we also found certain biomarkers, certain genes, which was involved in metastasis. So you know that cancer spreads, but what defines that spreading? So there has to be some gene. So we found some gene, which is called as an MMP10, and in this, from, from the same genomic study in an unbiased way, you sequence the whole thing, and then you look for significantly altered genes. You found MMP10, and then we found that, that it is likely uh, telling which patient will uh, have a disease which will spread out, and in which patient it will not. So, but then how would you validate that? 
So again, an orthotopic model. You remember uh, we showed an orthotopic model for the lung. Uh, now it is for the tongue. Okay. So here's what it is. So uh, again, the same postdoc, Dr. Ashwin Butlay takes a mice, anesthetizes the mice, and here pulls out the tongue and takes the cells derived from the human tumors um, and uh, and uh, injects the cell directly into the tongue of it. Okay. So you could see this bulge. Now this bulge is going to retract in some time, will diffuse, but then uh, what you will get to see with a specified period of time as it kind of like lapses um, that um, there would be tumor formation and uh, exactly in the tongue. So um, this is what it is like over a period of 28 to 30 days. And this is how the tumors kind of like come in there. Um, uh, this is how it kind of like looks for. Now these cells are, the whole idea was to ask the question that whether these cells are responsible, uh, these, uh, these genes are responsible for the spreading of the cell to the body. Right. Uh, so here's what it is. The cells were tagged with luciferase again, and here's it is like injected. And you can see that even though the tumor is not formed, but with the imaging, you are able to see uh, uh, these tumor cells, even when the tumors are not visible to the eye. You can see these signals. Some of these mice are showing, and uh, those uh, uh, where we uh, where we get rid of that gene, uh, the uh, and when injected to the mice, they do not find they do not form these tumors, uh, suggesting that those genes that MMP10 is important for the uh, for the formation of tumor. And also, we go on to say that when this was present in the uh, tongue, this, uh, the, uh, the gene had, uh, overexpression of the gene had the cells metastasize across the whole. So you are able to monitor that uh, uh, by, um, uh, by, by, by doing these kind of like assays. So you do the genomic studies, you find candidates, and then you validate them by a series of cell-based and then finally validate in an in vivo settings. So moving on to the last part of it, um, there is a, a, a gallbladder cancer. Now gallbladder cancer, again, a major initiative from my laboratory here at Tata Memorial Center. Uh, gallbladder cancer is uh, considered as a rare disease in the other world um, uh, and, uh, uh, countries with a higher income group. Uh, because it is not, it is a rarity, it does not happen over there. However, in the Northern Indian belt by the Ganges, it is one of the highest out there in the world, okay? So, but then no one has kind of like really systematically looked for. So again, we go ahead and do the sequencing using a next generation sequencing platform and sequence all the 20,000 genes, okay? And another student, uh, Prajisha here, finds mutation uh, in a gene, ERB2. So Dr. Shivasta was earlier mentioning about the treatment of HER2 in, uh, in breast cancer. This is exactly the same gene. Now that's the excitement, okay? So you are finding the same gene to be mutated and for which there is a drug, there is a treatment in breast cancer. So uh, I will not take into the details of it. Basically what Pajish found that 40% of these HER2 or the ERB2 gene was altered in gallbladder cancer. So the question is that can the treatment which is approved for breast cancer or colorectal cancer can be extended to the uh, gallbladder cancer for which there is absolutely no treatment. Oral cancer that what we were working on, there is no treatment. Um, to the gallbladder cancer, there is no treatment available. These are the discoveries that is really leading us that these are the possible ways that you can kind of like treat them. And now that we sit onto the tumor board, we get all the different kind of like queries of like the patients harboring these kind of like alteration. Again, the validation is being done by the mice, by the xenograft assays, and then what you kind of like get to see that those which are um, uh, treated uh, with the effatinib, there is a very significant response um, uh, in, in, in those patients, in, in those mice. So, um, but then the question kind of like comes that as what I said earlier, that the notch was there, uh, even in the normal cell, RB2 is not there exclusively in the tumor cells or FGFR3 or the EGFR, they are there in the normal cell and they are there in the tumor cell as well, both the cells, right? So the question comes up that, okay, we are talking about personalized, personalized, or we were talking about um, um, uh, precision medicine, but then how do we target a gene which is there exclusively in the tumor cells? When there was a translocation in the CML, that was still fine because that was a unique gene only in the tumor cell. In this case, we are talking about a gene which is there in the normal cell and which is also there in the tumor cell. So um, the normal cell would also get affected, but they do not. And why? Here's the reason. 
uh, I will introduce you the concept of oncogene uh, addiction. What does that mean? So a normal cell, what happens, it has kinases. We know that there are 510 kinases. Um, if you are taking an EGFR inhibitor or an FGFR inhibitor or an I mean, whatever inhibitor that what we had talked about, you take those inhibitors and you uh, inhibit that action, there's a lot of redundancy in the normal cell. Kinase A may not be able to function, but then kinase B will take up its function and the cells would survive. However, what happens in the tumor settings, these genes are mutated, right? Either mutated or they have a very high number. To an extent that what happens is that these cells, the tumor cells, they become dependent on the signaling. What that means is an, uh, that's the concept of oncogene addiction where these genes become essential for the survival of the tumor cells. Now that brings a pharmacological vulnerability, right? So now if you would, now if you would inhibit this gene with an inhibitor, while in this case, the kinase two will take it up, in this case, this cell was so much dependent on the activation of this signaling that what we tend to get to see that the cells would die. So, so, so the basis of this um, uh, precision medicine is the concept of oncogene addiction, that the tumor cells are addicted to these oncogenes. And that's why it's important to make these kind of like discoveries of oncogene addictions and then, and then, uh, and then, and then treat them. So, um, which again brings to a different kind of like questions uh, is that, okay, now what we have seen is that we started with the concept of that cancer is a single disease, right? That's how people were kind of like taking about, taking leukemia and treating all of them with the chemotherapy. So it turns out that that perhaps not is the case. But then now that we are doing all these genome sequencing, what it turns out that every cancer appears to have its own unique signature. If you would remember the columns of the heat map that I had shown, they all had a different spectrum of mutation. So what does that mean? I mean, every patient is going to be um, uh, treated with uh, uh, several different inhibitors, um, multiple different inhibitors across multiple different alterations. It turns out no. What it turns out is that now with a better understanding of it, that all the different mutations that appears to um, uh, get enriched in the tumor, they appear to converge to a tractable number of pathways, the molecular pathways. So even if there might be so many different mutations, so these mutations, they are all part of a signaling pathway. So now if you, and that would be a tractable number, uh, uh, a number that could be easily be handle. So now basically you can use any inhibitor of that inhibits that pathway and not necessarily that gene. So there would be a cascade of gene that would be involved in a signaling pathway and you inhibit um, the pathway downstream and wherever be the mutation, it does not really kind of like matter. So even if there would be a multiple mutations, you can still target the molecular pathways because majority of them converge onto the molecular pathway. So these are the newer emerging paradigm and newer understanding and what, how it is really kind of like um, uh, changing uh, in the clinics that the patients are being treated. Uh, th this is how it is. And this is how it is happening at Tata Memorial and at most of the leading centers out there in the world. So now patients are, the taxonomy has changed. The definitions have changed, okay, to quite a certain extent in the practice. Now, the patient samples are being run through the next generation sequencing platform about which I did not talk about in detail, but then uh, this is a, um, a machine that gives you all the different mutations that is there present in the patient. And then a lot of informatic analysis is done because the data that comes out from these machines are, are huge uh, in gigabytes. And then um, uh, 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 automated tools are used. We have ourselves developed some tools which is already out there. Uh, and then the clinicians basically get to know that based on the molecular mutations that this patient harbors, what are the possible treatments that you tend to give? So what it is kind of like telling us that the field has emerged in a way that it's not just the clinicians. It requires um, people uh, who can analyze these high throughput data. This is the bioinformatics people people who can find patterns to it and people who can find, so we need statisticians and mathematicians to analyze that data. Um, so, so, so if you would see my laboratory, uh, it would be an amalgamation of biochemists, molecular biologists, statisticians, informatics students, and clinicians. And uh, so, so they all need to, I mean, we have been talking about the multidisciplinary approach is something that is what is kind of like required because now we have moved on way much from an initial 
thought process of a single disease and a single chemotherapy, which is basically a poison to be given, but rather unravel the complexities, identify the molecular mutations, and then uh, design a treatment. So it, it is an approach that requires people from multidisciplinary team. So with that, I kind of like bring an end and summarize that what we have been talking about. So we talked about, we started with the, the clinical um, uh, presentation and its uh, limitation associated with it. We, we talked about the paradigm and, and we learned that cancer is not a single disease, uh, 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 but each of these cancers, they are different disease in its own settings. And even within the same cancer, they're depending on the different molecular alteration, it, it, it is likely to be a distinct disease. We talked about the interplay of the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes, um, um, uh, uh, about the survival and the death signal and um, um, uh, how a normal cell proliferates and uh, uh, and in the case of cancer, uh, how things get deregulated. We talked about the genetic basis, uh, a shift in paradigm um, that uh, that it's that the cancer is basically a genetic disease. And we took an example of CML, where the BCR able was the example that what we took uh, to uh, classify them and not only classify them, we showed that this genetic basis also has um, uh, therapeutic aspect associated to it. And then we briefly talked about the precision medicine, the precision medicine um, to uh, the, the field that we are kind of like moving to treat the uh, tumor types. And then we talked about uh, in the field of precision medicine that the discoveries uh, that personally my laboratory has been involved and has been contributing to the field. We talked about the discovery based on the a uh, hypothesis-based manner in which uh, initially in the laboratory, um, uh, Dr. Matthew Myerson uh, at the Broad Institute uh, before even I joined there. So uh, they found the EGFR mutations in the lung cancer by sequencing 50 gen, um, kinases. I went on to sequence 500 kinases and found FGFR2 mutation, everything pointing towards the precision medicine, uh, uh, ingredients for the precision medicine. Then uh, the technology became more and more uh, available to, the, uh, to us. And then we went in an unbiased way without an hypothesis, sequencing the whole genome, all the 20,000 genes and find FGFR3 mutations as unique mutations, which are druggable in the in, uh, lung cancer of Indian origin, now Asian. Um, we, found, we talked about briefly about the notch one alterations in tongue cancer. Um, we also talked about the MMP10. You remember the metastasis in the lung, in the tongue, in the tongue. We talked about the orb two alterations in the gallbladder cancer. And uh, then we went on to talk about um, uh, the fundamental principle, the basis of the precision medicine, how it really works is the concept of oncogene addiction, that how cells are addicted to these oncogene activation. We talked about that, how the pendulum is kind of like the genetic complexities that it is there. One should not kind of like get like so much bothered that there is too much of mutations now. There was no mutations early, but then where it is, it is still kind of like has uh, uh, a way out and uh, then we finally ended up uh, by talking about the future of the cancer treatment um, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that lies on a multidisciplinary team approach uh, uh, to take the decision that whether what treatment is best tailored or best suited for a patient that is to be given. So this is where ACTRAC is, where I kind of come from. It is another arm of the Tata Memorial Center. It is based in Kargar. Um, in the suburbs of Mumbai. Um, if you happen to be, uh, I mean, we have PhD programs. Um, uh, please write to us and please reach out to us. I did show some discoveries as well. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, which was not done by me, but by the whole team. Uh, here is a big team uh, that what we were kind of like involved with. And finally, um, uh, just one slide. Now we have moved on into the COVID. A lot of work has been done by my laboratory, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, made contributions to the uh, diagnostic kit and uh, to the understanding of the evolution of the viruses, and it has been well been talked about. Uh, uh, after the research, now we have started a charity drive uh, for the underprivileged. We are, um, we are uh, vaccinating the underprivileged at um, uh, Cargar. So we want a more and more content. If you are living around in Kargar, if you have an underprivileged person such as a domestic maid or street vendors who 
the chance of them getting vaccinated is low, we have started a drive. So I just wanted to let you know, vaccination, which is the way out to the COVID. Uh, if you want to know anything more about it, it is there on ActRive website. Reach out to me, uh, write to me more, and we will see that what we can do uh, uh, for you. So thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Professor Shivasa, for having me. And I'm happy to take questions, should there be some. All right, thank you so much, Amit, for this wonderful lecture. You started from you know really basic concept and very elegantly explained them, and then took to the you know, actual research world and showed the actual uh, research examples. I'm sure they're all very mesmerized and they will have a lot of questions, but given the shortage of time that you know we have next two speakers already lined up, uh, Nikia, a young scientist, and Dr. Ali from Tata Memorial, both are already waiting. So what I uh, you know, request participant, if they have any uh, specific question, they can put in the chat box. And I'm sure Dr. Amit will be happy to answer you over there. Sure. But one thing, you know, while I saw some chat chats, you know, among the participants, it looked very interesting that, you know, it looks like a good peer review process now where participants themselves are discussing and they're replying to each other, they're helping each other. And that's exactly what we wanted to develop in the summer camp, you know, where, when you have a peer group where, where you can discuss these things yourself, and you start you know, engaging into meaningful discussions. So thank you so much, Amit, yeah. for doing thank this you. wonderful work and sharing your knowledge and your experience with uh, yeah. uh, you know, the growing scientists and budding scientists here. So thanks a lot. And uh, participants, we will quickly move on to the next yeah. thank presenter, you, who is of your age, who is a young scientist. Uh, and let me just first start in introducing her, and then we will uh, request her to share her presentation.